We'd like to give you an opportunity to worship God this morning with your finances by giving back a portion of what God has entrusted to you. Tithing is an act of worship, and as followers of Jesus, tithing is an act of worship that we are called to do. Tithes allow us, as a church, to reach out and connect people to Jesus. So to give this morning, you can go and visit thegatheringottawa.com giving. Thank you for giving. Hey everybody, Jeff here, lead pastor at The Gathering Ottawa, and it's so good to have you tracking with us online here today. Uh, we post our sermons from our Sunday morning service online on YouTube every Sunday afternoon for two groups of people in particular. First group we post our sermons for are those of you who consider The Gathering your home, but you just weren't able to be with us for whatever reason on Sunday morning for worship. Maybe you're traveling for work, maybe you're on vacation, maybe you're sick, maybe you're immunocompromised and you're never able to come. Whatever your story is, for whatever reason it is that you weren't able to be with us on Sunday morning, these sermons are here for you. And we hope that this Sunday's teaching is a blessing to you in your faith journey, wherever it is that you're watching from. But the second group of people that we post these sermons for are those of you who are considering coming to the gathering but just aren't sure yet. You're checking us out online and on YouTube to get a sense of who we are and what we're like and what our teachings like, what are some of the things that we talk about and all that kind of stuff. We recognize that most people nowadays will do that before going to a church. They'll go online and look to get a sense for what that church is like before ever checking them out in person on Sunday mornings. And so if that's you, we hope that these sermons being posted here are a help to you, are a blessing to you in your faith journey, and that maybe, just maybe, we will see you on a Sunday morning service sometime soon. We gather at 10.30 a.m. at St. FX High School in Riverside South in Ottawa. The address there is 3740 Spratt Road, and we would so love to have you join us as we worship Jesus together and open the scriptures together to become more like him together. Uh, we'd love to be able to walk with you and have you join us, not just online, but in person as well. Whatever the case though, whether you're already part of the, the gathering or just checking us out, if there's anything that we can do to serve you, to help you in your faith journey, we'd love to connect with you. Make sure to fill out our online connect card at thegatheringottawa.com slash connect so that we can follow up with you and walk with you in your journey of faith. If you're curious about how to give to the ministry of The Gathering, uh, you can check us out online at thegatheringottawa.com slash giving. There's information there about how to give. And if you're looking just for information about our church, maybe some events that are coming up and all that kind of stuff, all of that's on our website as well. You can find that at thegatheringottawa.com. For now, though, we're just so privileged that you take some time to join us and to watch this Sunday's teaching and hope that the sermon from this past week is a blessing to you in your faith journey, wherever you find yourself in your journey of faith with Jesus. And we hope to see you soon on a Sunday morning in person. God bless you. Ephesians 2, a 19 to 22 and I'll be reading from the NIV. So again, that's Ephesians 2, starting at 19. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God loves, lives by his spirit. Amen. Thank you, Christy. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so very much for hosting us and gathering together for the shared worship gathering. Jeff, we really appreciate you and the folks at the, at the gathering hosting everybody this morning. And I know for, for the rest of you, it's a little bit of a change in schedule. You're used to gathering at 4 p.m. And uh, so to come out this way and, and to arrange your, your Sunday rhythm, we really appreciate you uh, being here with us. My name is Ryan Yancey. I'm the Interim Executive Director with the Ontario MD Conference. And uh, so you may be aware we're in a point of transition and actually uh, Jeff Yancey is, is chairing our search team. We're going to be looking for a permanent executive director and, uh, and then I'll slide back my previous ministry director role. But uh, so if you could pray for us in the next couple of weeks, we're going to be, we are, our team is seeking 
God's direction for the individual who will lead us into this next stage. And I feel really hopeful about where God is leading us in the next number of years as we join together in, uh, in making disciples. Uh, th- so this, this week, there's a number of us, and we're traveling to the different regions in Ontario. So we're going to have a, a gathering in the GTA, a gathering in uh, Niagara, a gathering in Waterloo Region, and also in Leamington. And, and actually tomorrow morning, gathering with, with pastors and a few others, uh, your pastors. And, and so anyway, I was telling my mother about this, and she's like, oh my goodness, you're going to be meeting out by the end of the week. And I said, no, 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 like, I love this. This is so, this is fun. This is life-giving. I find so much joy in this. And it's a little bit because in my role of uh, leading our churches, caring for our pastors, supporting our churches, it's kind of like if you're a pastor and you only get to see your people like a couple times a year. Like these guys, uh, th- these pastors, they, they see you on a weekly or, you know, they're with you on a weekly basis. And so for myself, as I get to hear about what God's up to in our churches, as I see the beautiful things God is doing through your leaders, um, I love it. It's exciting. God's at work. And so it is very, very joyful to be in the room uh, with all of you. And just to say that uh, Christy and I together, and I know this reflects, we have our board chair, Michelle Knowles, here. Uh, we love your pastors. Do you know, like, you have really good pastors here uh, among your churches. Yeah, we just see such good leadership and such, like, a authentic, deep desire to walk with Jesus in Jeff Yancey here with the gathering in uh, Doug Valerio at Manitick Community Church, in Dan Danchuk Reed with uh, with Bytown, and David Hood with Southeast City Church, and then we also have Darren Milley with us this morning, who is planting pastor at Manitick, worked as a chaplain with the Armed Forces for a time, now is in the trucking industry, and initiating a, uh, a disciple making uh, movement in in the trucking industry. You'll hear about that a little bit later, um, but another one of our, our pastors, and so we just yeah we, we you guys have great pastors. Uh, and we hear about you through them, and so there's joy in, in being here and seeing you face to face. The family that I'm a part of, there's six of us. My wife, Brittany, is a, is a registered nurse, and then we've got four kids, and they are 12, 10, 9, and 6. So our, our family's full of lots of, uh, lots of joy, lots of activity, certainly moments of angst as well. It's not all, all glorious, um, but that, that's our household. And over the years, we've had some, some seasons in which people have come to live with us, if they're young adults in between uh, housing, and uh, as well as my, my mother-in-law is going to be joining with us to live alongside us in the spring. And so our, we've got our household, but then our hope is that it's a little bit of an extended family where people would find uh, support and, and refuge alongside us as well. And now, my six-year-old, just two weeks ago, there was one evening where she was just distraught. My, my wife, Brittany, had gone off for a, a night shift. She works in obstetrics. It was off. She left. And, and I don't know if that kind of had my... Sometimes the kids don't love it when mom heads off to work and, and uh, misses out on, on bedtime. And, and so I don't know if that's what triggered my, my six-year-old, Hannah, or, or what. But So she was just sobbing uncontrollably. I'm like, Hannah, what's the matter? What's going on? And, and she could barely get the words out. And here it turned out that she was particularly bothered that evening that she always has to go to bed before everybody else. She misses out on all the fun that happens after she's in bed. And she said, and I'm the youngest, so I'm always going to have to go to bed first. And so we gathered around her, and we gave her hugs, and we encouraged her, and we said, Hannah, don't worry, we actually don't have any fun after you're in bed. And then a couple of the other siblings said, like, Hannah, like, in a few years, you're going to be older, and you're going to be a teenager, and then you can stay up way later. Like, as you get older, you'll probably end up staying up later than the rest of us because we'll want to go to bed. And, and, and so anyway, we tried and tried, and we, we, we did our best to support her, to kind of coach her through this. We thought, aha, we'll call uh, my younger brother, Dwight. Dwight also is the youngest of four children, and he also hated going to bed earliest when he was a little kid. So we called up Dwight on the phone, and she chatted. She barely threw her sobs, got out her problem, and, and so Dwight empathized with her, and he's like, I totally remember all this. And he kind of said the same things, of like, just so you know, it gets better. The years will come when you get to stay up late. Anyhow, in her moment of sorrow and significant grief, uh, we as a family, as a household, came around her to support her and to cheer her on. And so I see, and, and, and she, we, she was able to, the, the sobbing resided, she was able to get to sleep. The next morning she had a smile on and, and she was good to go. And we reminded her, remember, you will get to go to bed later than us uh, years down, down the road. But this, this was us as a household coming around 
Hannah to support her and to cheer her on. As we're gathered together this morning, we're considering this idea of of what does it mean to be a household of faith together. And so maybe you consider what what has your household looked like? And I understand that some households it's life-giving and there's much blessing and other households are more challenging. There's no question about that. I'm sure we have the array of experiences in this room. But if if your home was a place of blessing and safety and security or maybe you have an idea of what that could have been or what that looks like, I want you to imagine, what, what does it look like to be a part of a household, to live life side by side? In our family, as I'm sure it's the case in yours or in your ideal, we encourage one another. We name the good and the truth that we see in one another. We call it blessing, we, we call it gifting, and we speak blessing. But we also challenge each other, and we instruct one another. We pray for one another, and we fight I think every household, to varying degrees, we fight with one another. The current fight right now is about what's the correct date to put up the Christmas tree. Uh, that, that's an ongoing year after year. Uh, I, yeah, <laughs> it goes up far too early, in my opinion. But we have other challenges, as sometimes we interact with one, one another in really, really uh, selfish ways, or we'll make a mean-spirited comment, or we just simply can't agree on what the priorities for our family, whether it's the movie we watch that night, or how we spend our weekends, or whose hockey practice we go to when the schedule conflicts. Within our home, one member currently is really struggling with their math homework. It's been a real, a real issue, kind of the, the effects of COVID still actually going running through our, our family. And so we have other family members that are good at math that coach her and instruct her in that. At one point, one of our kids started a Bible club at school. And so we gather around, we prayed for them before they went out the door. Sometimes we share our resources as a family. I mentioned that we've had a few stages where people have lived with us. And then one of our kids gives up their own uh, bedroom. They don't, they don't always love it. We kind of tell them, you know, this is what we're doing. They, uh, they come around. But sharing those resources and sacrificing for one another... A while back, there was one of our kids that was being bullied significantly at school, and, and I didn't realize how deeply it was affecting this child until one night they just started sharing from their heart at the supper table. And we had this moment of actually crying with this kid around the table as we felt that pain. This is life together as a household, figuring out what it means to thrive, to grow, to be agents of God's blessing in the world. It's beautiful, it's complex, it's tricky. It's encouraging. This is life as a household. And so I hold up that question. What does it mean for us to be a household of faith? Now I want you to take note. In in our text that Christy read from the book of Ephesians, it uses this metaphor of a household. Now when we think of a household, oftentimes, not always, but often the usual is a nuclear family. Mom, dad, and whether it's one one to six kids or however many, what we think of a nuclear household. In Paul's day, it was generally an extended household. It was a household where you had um, extended family members. It was a household where maybe you had employees that were living there with you. It was much more flexible, much more ambiguous. Um, The family was understood a little bit broader than that. But this idea of family, scattered throughout the New Testament, it consistently refers to God's people as family. New Testament's regularly talking about sisters, and brothers, uh, most of you I've not met, and yet you are my sister, you are my brother, we are family together. And actually in Matthew chapter 12, Jesus says, who are my father, my mother, my sister, my brothers? Verse 50, he says, whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother, my sister, and my mother. And so we as a people collectively gather together, having placed our faith in Jesus, having received new life through Christ, Collectively, we say we want to do the will of our Heavenly Father. And so, we are sisters and brothers with Jesus. We are sisters and brothers in the household of God, living together as those who encourage each other, cheer each other on, form one another, disciple one another, fight with one another, seek out to be on mission together. We are this household of faith, as our text suggests. And I'm just going to read that that section again that Christy shared earlier, where it says, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but you are fellow citizens with God's people. And then this metaphor that we're focusing on today, also members of his household. 
And then it proceeds to say, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. Jesus is our foundation. Why am I no longer a stranger with Noah Grossman? I've, uh, Grossman, I've really enjoyed getting to know the last couple of years. He served on our o and board. We are brothers, not because he's a super guy. He is a super guy. Uh, we are brothers because it's Jesus who holds us together. Jesus saving life, death, and resurrection. This story of God that we're caught up in, this is the cornerstone of our faith. Jesus is our King, our Savior, our Teacher, our Friend, our Brother, the Lord of all. We're going to celebrate that and hone in on that a little bit as we share in the Lord's Supper later this morning. So you might be asking still, why a household? And why are we here to celebrate this household of the Ontario Conference of MD Churches? And I understand that there are other believers that are gathering for worship just down the road in other church communities who are not Mennonite brethren. And so I just want to dive into this a little bit in terms of what the household of God means and looks like. So first of all, we are a part of the global household of God. Those across nations, across tongues, across tribes, those who confess their faith in Jesus, the historic church and then the global church, we are a member of this household in relationship with one another. This past week, I had the privilege of of hosting a leader for a series of conversations Um, an MB leader from Central and South America, and he's sharing the incredible revival movement that God's doing in the older Brazilian church, as well as the significant mission that's unfolding in the Amazon, and had the sense of, like, these are our brothers and sisters in Christ, the global church, who we need to actually sit at the feet of and learn from, because God's moving in ways that we long to see here. So we're part of the global church, if you want to imagine the global household of Jesus. We're also a part of regional Households of Jesus. So as, as I've gotten to know in the last couple of years, the story of the church in Ottawa, I keep hearing about one-way ministries. It's absolutely remarkable. It's beautiful in terms of how churches of different denominations, different stripes and flavors, sharing this faith in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, but they gather together across denominational lines. Like that, that's, a, that's astounding. And it is unique to this region. God has blessed you here through the ministry of of one way. It's amazing. And we celebrate that, of that household of churches, that community where you're doing this life of family across denominational lines. But then you may say, okay, so why does it matter to be a part of this MD household? And I'm, I'm not going to dive into a long treatise about that. Um, but then there's also this place where it makes sense to gather and partner in certain ways with believers of like mind, of a bit of a closer shared identity. And, and you kind of find your tribe. And uh, I'll, I'll let your pastors kind of do the work of kind of like, what, what does it mean if you're unfamiliar in terms of being a part of the MDs? What's that specific spiritual identity and history and, and all of that? I'm, I'm going to guess that many of you, if not all of you, you arrived in your church because like, hey, this is a great church. Uh, probably very few of you are like, I really want to be MD, and that's why you, you arrived. So you're discovering that along the way, that we are this household, and we support one another as this kind of particular theological and spiritual identity. And so I want to invite you. I want to invite you to continue within your local communities, within your regional community, within the global community, but then also within our conference of churches to consider what does it mean to be a household of faith. This being a household where we know one another, where we are known and we are cared for. Manatee Community Church is in the midst of transitioning into a new facility. And they're like in the intensity of like, they're like building and overseeing. They're like getting chairs and like, it's just, it's really intense right now. Ask Doug about it. Um, super intense. And we're over here knowing that story and like, I can't help because I'm a couple hours away, but I'm cheering them on. I'm praying for them. There's this knowing and caring. We support one another relationally, logistically, financially, through training. We have an organization with the MDs called Legacy that provides financial services, payroll services for churches. They offer advice on HR and administrative pieces. And so that's just another example. Or in this family, we support each other. We disciple one another. I've been learning so much from David and Diana Hood, and I could cite examples from each of the churches, but I've been learning from them what it looks like to be on mission with folks in high-density, low-income communities. And it's just amazing how their posture and their faithful witness is bearing fruit. So I'm being discipled by them. 
Um, I'm having I'm being discipled by Dan Reed. It's so encouraging to hear uh, in his urban context. So I live in a little town called Wellesley. I've got an older man who drives a horse and buggy that I live at the end of his lane. My contest is vastly different from the Glebe. But I'm learning from Dan in terms of what does it mean to engage in society and the cultural realities around us to be witness, witnesses to Jesus. And then we join together in mission. I just want to take a moment and honor you as the gathering for how you have blessed Dan Reed and Bytown Community Church, sending them out and planting, like facilitating that, supporting that. Uh, it, 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 like it's amazing. Like if we could like clone this and have this happen through other churches, I'd be overjoyed. So thank you. I want to honor you. I want to bless you. This is what it looks like to be a household of faith together. We are a household of faith built on the apostles and the prophets with Jesus as our cornerstone. We are part of a household of faith in your local church, with the global church of Jesus, your regional church, and then within this kind of unusual family that God has placed you within. I'm so glad to be a part of this household, this family with you. And I invite you, in applying the words of Jesus I invite you to consider what does it mean to live side by side within this family, within this household. At this point, we're going to hear from our four pastors. So I'll just invite uh, Jeff and Dan and, uh, and David and Doug to come join me. We, uh, yeah, we won't want to create opportunity for, for you all to hear from these uh, excellent leaders. Oh, thanks, Jeff. I missed the plaid memo. I would have been happy to have worn plaid if I didn't know who that was. You're not wearing your pastor costume. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. All right, so as, as I mentioned, um, so for Christy and I, I can speak on behalf of our board, we love your pastors. They are... They are wise, and we see this just genuine heart for Jesus. And so we want to hear from them. So I'm just going to pose a number of questions here. Just give me one, uh, one moment. Okay, so we'll just go down the, we'll start with you, Jeff. We'll go down the row. Who are you, and who is your church? A brief introduction. Brief. Emphasis on brief. Uh, I, I, I didn't, follow, I didn't here, follow my instructions to be you're brief. You're in trouble if you want brief. Um, with four of us up here. Uh, I've said hi already. I'm Jeff. I'm the pastor here at the gathering. I'm Doug. I am the pastor at Manapik Community Church. That's the briefest I've ever given. <laughs> I'm Dan, and uh, this morning said, what church are you from? My little guy said, but daddy, we're part of the gathering and by town. Ah, so my, my five-year-old knows. Um, he gets it. So I'm a church planner of by town community church and I'm a staff of the, of the gathering. Hi, I'm David Hood and I help give leadership at, <laughs> at uh, Southeast City Church. Uh, we're a six-year-old church plant in Alta Vista. There we are. All right. So, my first directed question, how does the house of God metaphor inform your engagement with a broader Christian church? I'm going to direct that one toward David and Jeff. How does the household of God metaphor inform your engagement with a broader church? <laughs> um, yeah, so I was reflecting on this, and I, I love the idea that I am not the whole structure I'm just a part of the structure. I'm not the household of God. Uh, my church isn't the household of God. Even the Mennonite brethren are not the, the household of God. We all bring something to the table, and we all need each other. And over the years, I have learned a lot from my brothers and sisters in different denominations. I didn't grow up Mennonite brethren. I've grown up Presbyterian, Baptist, Plymouth brethren for a while. Uh, so I've, I've been around, um, always in more conservative evangelical circles. But, like, I, I enjoy the theological rigor of my Presbyterian brothers and sisters, the openness to the Spirit and all of the gifts of my charismatic brothers and sisters, the, the social justice commitment of my Catholic brothers and sisters. And so I just, I, I always 
learn from people from other denominations. And I think we need to have that, that humility to listen and learn from each other. And I actually experienced this beautifully recently. I was at a prayer summit uh, at Camp Iowa, uh, and there were uh, people from all denominations there praying together for our city. And on the last night, we had communion, and communion was led by a Jewish Christian man and an Arabic Christian woman, and they, like, forgave each other and blessed each other and led us in communion in Hebrew and Arabic and English and French, because there were people from Quebec there, and I just, I loved that. Um, so, yeah, just, just learning from each other. Beautiful. Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, it would be awkward otherwise. <laughs> I could leave it at that, but I won't. Um, no, I, when I think of the household of God metaphor, you know, the gatherings of household, right? Manifick Community Church is a household by town, south of city church. But if you read that Ephesians passage, Paul says, together he is forming us into one temple, right? So there's different people that make up different households. Those households together make up one larger household or temple, if you will. So for me, when I think of the household of God metaphor, when I think of what it is to be a part of a denomination, there's an important recognition there, and something's blowing up, so we're good, um, that we're not the only game in town. We're not the only household in town. We can't see God's kingdom come through us alone. It takes all of us together, and not just us. Of course, every church in this city, right? being aligned with God's heart, God's will, God's passions. We want to work across denominations with people that we disagree with on different things. If they're a Jesus-centered, Jesus-first kind of community of faith, then we're all in, right? But if we're not at least identifying with a local household and then together as a broader household, like it doesn't really mean anything then. The metaphor doesn't work unless we actually live into the household together. So first locally, then, you know, more regionally, but also more broadly with the non-MB church. So the household metaphor for me speaks to a lot of different things, the importance of belonging one to another, but also to the broader church, MB and otherwise. So. Yeah, 100%. So what, what would the unique giftings and experiences of each of your churches uh, that you bring to God's place for you? Doug, what are the unique giftings, experiences of Manifit Community Church that you bring offer within the household of God? Uh, I, when I look at our church, we're quite an eclectic bunch. You know, we come from all sorts of different backgrounds, uh, different uh, uh, different religious back, well, not religious backgrounds, but different Christian backgrounds. Uh, so, uh, you know, we would have people who've been formerly Catholic, formerly Anglican, formerly Presbyterian, formerly Pentecostal, all that kind of thing. So, so really, you know, our our identity as a church is really quite diverse. And so, uh, as we've had to navigate that uh, over the years, how do people from such widely differing Christian experiences and backgrounds, how do we all get along together? And uh, and we have, we have, and, and we've been growing together and deepening our faith with one another. And I would say probably that is something that we would bring to the table. Is a, is a diverse background of experience that we can empathize with others and relate to others and reach out to others. Yeah, super. Thanks, Doug. Oh, sorry, as you're talking, one other piece I haven't mentioned is that Doug is also a, a, on our board of directors here at Theater Conference, and, and Noah is also on the house board as well. So I just want to make sure we didn't forget that. Um, and Jeff is serving on our search team, which I mentioned, so thank you also. I want to honor you guys for serving the broader community as well. Dan, what unique gifting and experiences does Bytown Community Church bring to the table, to the household? Yeah. Um, I have a hard time with this question a little bit in terms of speaking on behalf of my whole community, but I think some of what we have to offer is um, deep questions. Mm -hmm. um, even this morning, I'm aware that a bunch of people in our community need this to be a very cross-cultural experience, and so I really appreciate people's love for Jesus and the willingness to engage still in organized church, even though for a lot of them there's been a lot of pain that we're processing together. So thanks for hanging in in a very cross-cultural experience. Um, I do think, though, that brings us some fresh perspective. Um, we have potential to be a multi-ethnic community, which I think would be a huge blessing to Owen MD. And um, I do think that there is a hope for our future. 
Center Church in Canada, as our church is very young. <laughs> but we'd also love if you know people that live downtown that are older that need a church. We'd love to meet them. But um, it gives me a lot of hope talking to other pastors who are seeing their young people leave. Uh, and a bunch of them are kind of limping into the doors of our church. And they have a huge blessing, but also responsibility. So please pray for us. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I could go on and on here. Um, I'm, I'm really proud of our little church. I, I would have to say, um, I think some of the things that we do really well, I think we do family really well. Uh, we eat together a lot. Um, we, we have people over to our house every single Sunday evening for dinner and just talk and hang out. Um, now it's a benefit of being a smaller church. There are some perks. Uh, I think I think we've done a good job, especially over COVID, of, of walking together in the way of Jesus while also not all being on the same page about everything. So we're able to disagree about things and sometimes disagree quite heatedly and passionately, but like we're willing to be a community and to walk with each other and to learn from each other and follow Jesus together. So... I, I think we do that really well. I think we also, uh, we're embedded in our community. We're embedded in the place that we're in. Um, we're, we're not a church that's just for ourselves. We do a lot of work, like Ryan said, with the low-income apartment complex. Uh, we run a food bank out of there, a prayer outreach out of there. And so being able to do ministry with people who are oftentimes neglected or ignored by the church and on the margins uh, and being an active participant and a known actor in our community is something I think we do well. Yeah, I, uh, I'm proud of our church uh, for some of the missional things that we're stepping into as well. You've mentioned the Bytown story. While that's more of an administrative function, uh, and then I and Dan connect, um, it's still pretty cool to know that we're part of Bytown's story and we get to bless them and, and the Bytown folk as they figure out uh, how how God's calling them to express the kingdom where they are. Um, in our church here at the, at the gathering, um, historically, this is changing a bit, but historically over half of our community are from this neighborhood, Riverside South. And so that's been kind of neat. It's like a neighborhood church. Growing beyond that, we're seeing some folks from other uh, parts of the city as well, which is okay. But we're going to eventually convince them to move to Riverside South, I think, so that we can run into each other at the grocery store and send our kids to the same school and all that kind of stuff. But that's been really fantastic, to be a, a parish type of church almost. Um, that, that's been a, a joy to express neighborhood together and care for our community. Um, you know, we've learned from David and, and uh, Southeast City Church and their journey with the food bank across the way. And we're asking Jesus to lead and guide us as we look to do something similar here in Riverside South as food insecurity is a growing uh, concern. And just lots of things I'm proud of for our community, the way we care for one another through the ups and downs uh, of life, um, the way that we're willing to step out in faith through this food bank thing being an example of that. Uh, far from perfect, lots of challenges, as is the case for all of us, I'm sure. Um, but love, just love our, our church community very deeply. So, yeah. Wonderful. Wonderful. And so I will direct this question to Doug and to Dan. Why does being a part of this particular MD High School matter to you? Why this household? Uh, I was on reflection thinking of uh, three, three main things for me. First of all, I would say that as MB churches, we're theologically generous. Uh, and I say that because, uh, you know, as a, as a church, we have a core, we have some core beliefs that, that, that we very much firmly hold to. But there are some secondary things which we're not, we don't fight over. You know, we don't fight over them. Uh, in fact, we're quite inclusive and, uh, and very generous within that. So we have people who would be, uh, for example, those who would uh, be more traditional and have uh, like a liturgy. Uh, we have those that would be more contemporary in their worship. Uh, we have those that would be more of a charismatic expression. And so those are things that, you know, we don't, we don't fight over those things. We embrace them and we celebrate those. So we're quite a diverse bunch across the board. And, uh, and so I would say that we are theologically generous and I value that. 
um, being as somebody who's come from somewhere that's not here. That's good. <laughs> Uh, secondly, I would say uh, for me that we have a genuine grassroots authenticity and a deep love for a Jesus-centered life. Uh, that's something that uh, I value. Uh, you know, different churches might align themselves more doctrinally down this path or that path. For us, I believe that we're focused on Jesus and a Jesus-centered lifestyle. And so as we read Scripture together in community, we read it through the lens of Jesus. So we read from Jesus back through the Old Testament. We look at Jesus and how that looks for our future. And so as a Christ-centered community, that resonates with me. And, uh, and so again, I'm very deeply grateful for that and how we do read in community, not just in, in isolation. And then I would say that we are missionally courageous as a denomination. I mean, I, I came into uh, this. Our church was planted uh, from sea to sea. There's Trevor over there. Uh, so, and I know David's was as well, and we've always, together as we've talked, how we're so grateful for the vision for church planting and for disciple making that this group of family of churches has. And now as we move into missional expressions and things like that, you know, we, we, uh, we've explored lots of different creative ideas. How do we reach our indigenous people differently to the way that we would reach others in our you know, at our location. So we're missionally courageous. And, uh, and that, I think, is always good because if, if we're not missionally minded, then we're going to stagnate and we die. And so this willingness to risk, willingness to be out there on the cusp and really pushing the boundaries of what does it mean to make disciples, plant churches, and be missional expressions, I deeply appreciate that in our family. Thank you, Doug. And I'm actually just going to interject for, for a moment in terms of just to acknowledge the significance of the C to C network collective and their their story. Like Manica Community Church is part of us because of C to C. Like the city is part of us because of C to C. Bytown Community Church is with us because of C to C. And so just to acknowledge that we're in a place kind of, of stuttering a little bit or just kind of finding our way again in terms of uh, church planting and new disciple making uh, communities. But we're we're ready. We're well positioned to take that next step in terms of that that courageous mission. And just Trevor Spieth is going to be joining us in leading the Lord's Supper. Um, he's joining me in that. And we, we love Trevor and are so thankful for the work that he's done in shepherding, whether you know it or not, shepherding your pastors and, and your community. So just to acknowledge and honor at this point, Trevor, you and, and uh, the work of CEC in this, in this area. Uh, Dan, yes. <laughs> yeah. I don't have a ton to add to what Doug said, but as a church planner, I appreciate the different perspectives because I can't imagine why you would join us. Like, <laughs> why would you sign up for one of the hardest jobs on the planet and do it by yourself? <laughs> it seems ridiculous. Um, so I appreciate the support, the accountability, but also being a part of something larger. Um, I also just appreciate when we get to bigger, hard theological questions that could be something that we discern in a bigger community than just your own. Uh, and to be connected to a global church, um, it's just as helpful um, than just being a little pocket of people in one place at one time. And so, yeah, I think being a part of a family is huge for that. And then personally, I can't say this on behalf of our whole community, but I do really appreciate the MD theology, um, the commitment to peace, the value for community. I think we're a bit more Mennonite than some of you in terms of sharing homes and sharing resources and sharing cars. Um, and then also pursuit of justice. I mean, these things are just really, really important to us as a family and to people in our, in our community. Yeah, cool. And the last question, I'm going to direct this one toward David and Jeff. What's your heart for how we can partner for mutual support and making disciples in the years ahead? Um, yeah, I think I, I understand that for the average congregant, being MD doesn't really impact your life all that much. I think it can as you especially delve into our theological um, uh, essentials and what makes us unique, and it, it can really help us grow in our faith. Um, but I hope that for each person here that there's at least an understanding like that we belong to something bigger than just our local household, local expression. 
that there's accountability built into that, theological accountability. Uh, you know, in our Constitution, for, for example, I said this last night to someone that, you know, if I ever lost my credentials or if I kind of went off the rails and stuff went crazy in my life, like I could lose my job because the denomination could step in and kind of keep us accountable. And I think that's important, like for pastors and churches to have that level of accountability. But also, I think it's important for our congregants to know that relationally, like we're keeping each other accountable too, you know, and we're not just theologically, but inter, you know, interpersonally and in how we engage together. We're looking to do missional things together where we can speak at each other's churches, pray for one another. I know one of the things that I've been convicted of on, on Sundays here is we don't actually talk about you guys on Sundays here. And we could, and we should, and we will moving forward. Gathering people, keep me accountable to that. We want to mention Manatee Community Church and just acknowledge that there's a sister church of ours down the street and bless them and pray for them every so often on Sundays and same with, with the other two. Um, so there's lots of things I think that, that we could do uh, to partner together for the sake of the kingdom. And a lot of it, though, is, is probably invisible to the average congregant, but I think it is important for you to understand that it's present, that it's there. Uh, and I think that's a sign of health, knowing that that accountability and relationship is in place. So, yeah. Yeah. We talk about the gathering all the time. I'm just, I'm just, um, <laughs> and how we're terrible and wrong? Or what are you? <laughs> uh, no. Um, yeah, so I, I think just to kind of build off what Jeff said, like for my people, uh, I think a denomination is really important because you can know that Diana and I, there's a group of people over us uh, who are holding us accountable to certain values, certain beliefs, to leadership, health. Um, and I, I just want to commend you, Ryan, Christy, the whole team. Like you guys check on us regularly. I know some denominations... Like, I, I've talked to some pastors who their denominations hardly ever say anything to them. There's very little connection, very little investment and involvement. And I feel like we're getting together multiple times a year, and you're frequently texting me, calling me, checking in on me. So thank you so much for that. Just know that these guys are doing their job, and they're doing it well. And that, that benefits us, which then benefits you. If the leaders are healthy, then the church can be healthy. Um, so that's a big part of why denominations are important. I think in terms of mutual support and disciple-making moving forward, uh, I think, Ryan, um, well, I guess it won't be you for forever. <laughs> there will be another executive director. But, well, you'll do this in your other role as well. Like, just as you travel around, like, you hear about what all the different churches are doing and what their strengths are. And you can kind of catalog that, like, what churches have what, because no one church as we've been saying, can have it all. You're not going to be able to do everything really well on your own. And so I think what we can do, what Southeast City Church, our churches can do, is we can, we can come to the table and we can say, here's what we've got. Like, here's what we do well. Here's what we can share. And then you can be the person who connects us with churches that need what we have. And then where we're struggling, we can be like, we, we, we're not doing this very well. Leadership, development, discipleship, ministry to the poor. We're not doing this very well. We need help. And you can connect us with people that are doing it well. And we can bless and benefit each other and grow all together. Yeah. Awesome. Dave, you just, you just described what I love to do. <laughs> uh, so you, you, you see here this, this, uh, this beautiful bunch we have. Thank you so much, Jeff. Doug, Dan, and David for sharing your insights and the people that you represent as you do for sharing. God bless you guys. Um, yeah, let's let's give them a, a round of applause.